Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your patience getting in here tonight. It's great to see such a full house. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first Story Hour in the Library event this season. My name is Kristen Spronia, and I'm the Story Hour coordinator. I also coordinate lunch poems, which many of you are probably familiar with. And this has been started sort of as the sister series of the lunch poem series. Um, I invite you to pick up a poster on your way out. We have a nice poster that's ready for your refrigerator or bulletin board or office door, um, giving you the whole lineup for the upcoming season. And we also have a mailing list there, which I also invite you to sign. And before we get started, I want to give to you David Doerr, the development the, the library development director who's been the great champion of this series and, and really was the, was the pioneer to get this series started here in the library. So, David Doerr. Any, anytime I'm getting up and Wavy Gravy shows up, I gotta tell you right there, I, I, I give it up. <laughs> Um, in January, we, uh, we inaugurated a uh, story hour in the library with a reading by Oakley Hall. Uh, Michael Shaben interviewed him also. Um, I'd like to read something. May 16th, 2008, Oakley Hall, 87, novelist attuned to the Old West is dead. Oakley Hall, the author of the novels Warlock and Downhill Racers and literary heir to fellow California writers like Wallace Stegner, died Monday at his home in Nevada City. He was 87. Mr. Hall, who began his career writing tightly constructed mystery novels, produced a steady stream of works most set in the American West, of which the best known is Warlock, a fictional reimagining of the gunfight at the OK Corral, called one of the best American novels in a holiday magazine review by Thomas Pynchon. The book retains a cult following and inspired the name of a rock group, Oakley Hall. Oakley graduated from the University of California, Berkeley in 1943. For nearly 20 years, until his retirement in 1990, Mr. Hall directed the writing program at the University of California, Irvine, where his students included Richard Ford and Michael Shaben. In 1969, he helped found the Squaw Valley Community of Writers in Nevada City, a summer writers conference where his students included Amy Tan. Um, we're dedicating something just briefly tonight in honor of Oakley, who was our inaugural reader. I'd like to read something from Warlock. Um, this is right at the end of the book, and it is a letter from uh, Henry Holmes Goodpasture, who was the uh, storekeeper to his grandson, Gavin, who is at Yale, and it's dated 1924, San Francisco, and the whole of the plot of Warlock takes place in the early 1880s in the fictitious town of Warlock. And so Good Pasture is talking about Clay Blaisdell, who comes as Marshall, and he was a gunfighter, and also about a gentleman named Caleb Bain, who is writing cheap Western fiction. He says to his grandson, I noticed in a recent volume of Western memoirs that Blaisdell is spoken of more as a semi-fictional hero than an actual man. But he was a man, I can attest to that, who have seen him eat and drink and breathe and bleed. And despite the fictions of Bain and his ilk, there have not been many like him, nor like Morgan, nor McQuone, nor John Gannon. But sometimes I feel as perhaps you may feel, looking back on the stories of these men I told you about when you were a youngin, that I myself was a fictionalizer with an imagination as active as that of Bain, or that of my own mind, as old men will do. I had gradually stylized and simplified these happenings, that I had fancifully glorified these people and sought to give them superhuman stature. I cry out in pain, that is not so, and all the same time come to doubt myself. But I kept a journal through these years, and although the ink is fading on the yellowing pages, it is still legible. One of these days, if you're interested, beyond merely trying to bulwark your arguments with a classmate, those pages shall be yours. Now that your letter has caused me to call to memory all those people and those years, I find myself wishing most intently that I had left me more time and the powers to flesh out my journals into the true history of Warlock in all of its ramifications before the man who was Blaisdell and the other men and women and the town in which they lived are totally obscured. 
and so less that Oakley Hall is not totally obscured. In this uh, library, there are very few but very significant people commemorated. One is a picture of June Jordan, who died in 2002. She was the founder of Poetry for the People. Uh, Josephine Miles, a wonderful poet and faculty member, the Poetry Alcove is named after her, and Dennis Coran, who was an early publisher, um, is, has a poetry collection there. So we are now going to add to this wonderful collection, Oakley Hall, and soon we will have a, a picture to that effect that says Oakley Hall, 1920, 2008, author, teacher, Cal alumnus, class of 43. Thank you, and I hope you join me in that. Thank you so much, Dave. We, we feel so lucky to have had Oakley here as our kickoff to the entire story hour in the library series um, before he passed last spring. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Melanie Abrams, who will introduce our reader tonight. Um, Melanie is the co-director of the Story Hour in the Library series, along with her husband, Vikram Chandra. They both serve on the English department here at Cal. And Melanie had a big year this past year, publishing her first novel, Playing, which I highly recommend. It's a thrilling ride, and we do have it available for sale. And um, her other great achievement is sitting over there in the, in the purple um, shoulder bag, little Leela. So, um, Melanie. Thank you. It's my pleasure tonight to welcome Michael Shabon, who really needs no introduction, especially in Berkeley. So I'll keep it short. Michael is the author, most recently, of The Giddish Policeman's Union and Gentlemen of the Road, as well as Maps and Legends, which is his first nonfiction work. His novel, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2001. He's won numerous other honors, including the Hugo and Nebula Prizes for The Yiddish Policeman's Union. There's so much pleasure to be found in Michael's writing, the sparkling, limber prose, the characters whose struggles and strivings become as real to us as our own, the sweep of his imagination and the breadth of his knowledge. But what I love about reading Michael's work most is that I always know that I'm going to get a great story. In our literary age of lyrical navel gazing and tiny epiphanies, it's exhilarating to encounter a writer who revels in the pleasure of story who understands how hard it is to construct plot and who does it so well. It's a little strange even to be so entertained by literary fiction because so often we associate entertainment with the mass produced explosions of Hollywood. In his introduction to the best American short stories of 2005, Michael writes about our beliefs about our own pleasures. Entertainment, he says, we believe, skirts the black heart of life and drowns life's lambency in a hal halogen glare. Intelligent people must keep a certain distance from its productions. They must handle the things that entertain them with gloves of irony and postmodern tongs. Entertainment, in short, means junk, and too much junk is bad for you. Bad for your heart, your arteries, your mind, your soul. Maybe the reason for the junkiness of so much of what pretends to have entertained us is that we have accepted, indeed we have helped to articulate, such a narrow, debased concept of entertainment. The brain is an organ of entertainment, sensitive at any depth and over a wide spectrum. But we have learned to mistrust and despise our human aptitude for being entertained. And in that sense, we get the entertainment he des we deserve. But, he adds, I read for entertainment and I write to entertain, period. A writer to whom we can turn to not only for edification, but also pleasure is a writer to be cherished. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Michael Shabon. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, now I feel like that, the lyrics from that Nirvana song are coming to mind. Here we are now, entertain us. Uh, I probably won't be able to now, so I apologize in advance. Um, I just wanted to say, before I get started, thank you all for coming. Um, and I just wanted to second what David was saying about Oakley Hall, who was my teacher at UC Irvine um, and was um, a very important teacher uh, in my life and a, a very important writer. And that book, Warlock, that David read to you from is 
a wonderful, wonderful novel, and everyone should go out and buy it immediately. Um, before I begin, the last thing that I want to say is just I forgot to put my Obama pin on my lapel. <laughs> so just imagine. Imagine that there's this little pin that says hope right there while I'm reading. So I didn't, this, I didn't do a book tour for this book, Gentlemen of the Road, because it came out the same year as Yiddish Policemen's Union, uh, which came out in May of 07, and this came out in November or October of 07, and I just couldn't face the prospect of doing another book tour, so I didn't. Um, so I'd, I've never read from this book out loud, um, and so this is the first time I'm gonna do it tonight. I hope I'm up to it, it has long sentences. Um, I wrote this novel originally as a serialized novel that was published in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Um, they called me and asked me if I would be interested in trying that. It's, it was a 14-part novel. Each part had to be exactly 2,000 words long and no longer. Um, and I had had this idea to do something that would be set in the world of, of the Khazars. Um, the Khazars were, were the, a people, they were a Turkic people. Uh, related to present-day um, peoples living in like Kazakhstan and that part of the world. Uh, and at some point in about the year eight or 900, they converted more or less en masse to Judaism. And they became this Jewish kingdom in the Caucasus area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea um, for like 500 years. And they were a hugely important, powerful empire. And then um, they faded into history and were largely forgotten. And, and as soon as I got this call, would you do this serialized novel thing, for some reason I thought right away of them. And uh, I decided to try to write a novel that would be set against that backdrop. So, Gentlemen of the Road, chapter one, on discord arising from the excessive love of a hat. For numberless years, a mina had astounded travelers to the caravansary with its ability to spew indecencies in 10 languages. And before the fight broke out, everyone assumed the old blue-tongued devil on its perch by the fireplace was the one who maligned the giant African with such foulness and verve. Engrossed in the study of a small ivory chatrange board with pieces of ebony and horn, and in the stew of chickpeas, carrots, dried lemons, and mutton, for which the caravansary was renowned, the African held the place nearest the fire, his broad back to the bird, with a view of the doors and the window with its shutters thrown open to the blue dusk. On this temperate autumn evening in the kingdom of Aran, in the eastern foothills of the Caucasus, it was only the two natives of burning jungles, the African and the Mina, who sought to warm their bones. The precise origin of the African remained a mystery. In his quilted gray bambakion, with its frayed hood worn over a ragged white tunic, there was a hint of former service in the armies of Byzantium, while the brass eyelets on the straps of his buskins suggested a sojourn in the West. No one had hazarded to discover whether the speech of the known empires, Khanates, Emirates, Hordes, and Kingdoms was intelligible to him. With his skin that was lustrous as the tarnish on a copper kettle, and his eyes womanly as a camel's, and his shining pate with its ruff of wool whose silver hue implied a seniority attained only by the most hardened men, and above all, with the air of stillness that trumpeted his murderous nature to all but the greenest travelers on this minor spur of the Silk Road, the African appeared neither to invite nor to promise to tolerate questions. Among the travelers at the caravansary, there was a moment of admiration, therefore, for the bird's temerity when it seemed to declare in its excellent Greek 
that the African consumed his food in just the carrion scarfing way one might expect of the bastard offspring of a bald pated vulture and a Barbary ape. <laughs> For a moment after the insult was hurled, the African went on eating without looking up from the chatrange board, indeed without seeming to have heard the remark at all. Then, before anyone quite understood that calumny so fine went beyond the powers even of the mina, and that the bird was innocent this once of slander, the African reached his left hand into his right buskin, and in a continuous gesture as fluid and unbroken as that by which a falconer looses his fatal darling into the sky, produced a shard of bright Arab steel, its crude hilt swaddled in strips of hide, and sent it hunting across the benches. Neither the beardless stripling who was sitting just to the right of its victim, nor the one-eyed Mahout, who was the stripling's companion, would ever forget the dagger's keening as it stung the air. With the sound of a letter being sliced open by an impatient hand, it tore through the crown of the wide-brimmed black hat worn by the victim, a fair-haired scarecrow from some fog-bound land who had ridden in that afternoon on the Tiflis Road. He was a slight, thin-shanked fellow, gloomy of countenance, white as tallow, his hair falling in two golden curtains on either side of his long face. There was a rattling twang like that of an arrow striking a tree. The hat flew off the scarecrow's head as if registering his surprise and stuck to a post of the daub wall behind him as he let loose an outlandish syllable in the roomy jargon of his homeland. In the fireplace, a glowing castle of embers subsided to ash. The mahout heard the iron ticking of a kettle on the boil in the kitchen. The benches squeaked, and travelers spat in anticipation of a fight. The Frankish scarecrow slipped out from under his impaled hat and unfolded himself one limb at a time, running his fingers along the parting in his yellow hair. He looked from the African to the hat and back. His cloak, trousers, Hose and boots were all black, in sharp contrast with the pallor of his soft hands and the glints of golden whisker on his chin and cheeks. And if he was not a priest, then he must, thought the Mahout, for whom a knowledge of men was a necessary corollary to an understanding of elephants, be a physician or an exegete of moldering texts. The Frank folded his arms over his bony chest and stood taking the African's measure along the rule of his bony nose. He wore an arch smile and held his head at an angle meant to signify a weary half-amusement, like that which plagued a philosophical man when he contemplated this vain human show. But it was apparent to the old Mahout, even with his one eye, that the scarecrow was furious over the injury to his hat. His funereal clothes were of rich stuff, free of travel stains, suggesting that he maintained their appearance and his own with fierce determination. The Frank reached two long fingers and a thumb into the wound in his hat, grimaced, and with difficulty jerked out the dagger from the post. He turned the freed hat in his hands, suppressing the urge to stroke it, it seemed to the Mahout, the way he himself would stroke the stubbled croup of a beloved dam as she expired. A Mahout is a, an elephant guy. <laughs> an elephant voila. With an air of incalculable gravity, as if confiding the icon of a household god, the Frank passed the hat to the stripling and carried the dagger across the room to the African, who had long since returned to his bowl of stew. I believe, sir, the Frank informed the African, speaking again in good Byzantine Greek, that you have mislaid the implement required for the cleaning of your hooves. 
The Frank jabbed the point of the dagger down into the table beside the chatrange board, jostling the pieces. If I am mistaken as to the actual nature of your lower extremities, I beg you to join me in the courtyard of this house at your leisure, but preferably soon, so that with the pedagogical instrument of your choice, you may educate me. <laughs> the Frank waited. The one-eyed Mahout and the stripling, wondering, waited. By the door to the inn, by the door to the inn yard, where the ostler leaned, whispered odds were laid and taken, and the Mahout heard the clink of coins and the squeak of a chalk wielded by the ostler, a swan, who disdained the distinction between turning a profit from seeing to the comfort of his guests and that of turning one from watching them die. I'm sorry to report, the African said, rising to his feet, his head brushing the beams of the sloping roof, speaking in the lilting, bastardized Greek used among the mercenary legions of the emperor at Constantinople, that my, learn my hearing shares in the general decay of the broken-down, black-assed old wreck you see before you. The African yanked the shard of Arab steel from the table, and with it, when in search of the Frank's voice box, ending his quest no farther from the pale knuckle of the Frank's throat than the width of the blade itself. The Frank fell back, bumping into a pair of Armenian wool factors at whom he glared as if it were some clumsiness of theirs and not his cowardly instinct for self-preservation that had cost him his footing. But I take your gist, the African said, returning the dagger to his boot. On the ostler's slate, the odds began to run heavily against the Frank. <laughs> and since this is story hour, I'll show you. The, there's a picture. <laughs> Beautiful illustrations by the great Gary Gianni, who does the Prince Valiant comic strip nowadays. Uh, okay, where were we? The African restored the chatrange board and pieces to a leather pouch, wiped his lips, and then pushed past the frank, past the craning heads along the benches, and went out into the inn yard to kill or be killed by his insulter. As the men trooped after him into the torchlit courtyard, carrying cups of wine, wiping their bearded chins on their forearms, the weapons belonging to the combatants were fetched from a rack in the stable. If... Because of his immensity, the span of his arms and his homicidal air, and despite his protestations of senescence, which were universally regarded as gamesmanship, the betting had been inclined to favor the African before the weapons were fetched, the arming of the two men decided it. The Frank carried only a long, absurdly thin bodkin that might serve in a pinch to roast a couple of birds over an open fire if they were not too plump. The travelers had a good laugh at the tailor with his needle, and then pondered the mystery of the African's choice of sidearm, a huge Viking axe. Its haft an orgy of interpenetrating runes, the quarter moon of its blade glowing cold as with satisfied recollection of all the heads it had ever lopped from spouting necks. <laughs> Under the full moon of the month of Mare, with the torches hissing, the African and the Frank circled an ambit of packed earth. The Frank minced and scissored on his walking stick legs, the tip of his bodkin indicating the heart of the African, glancing from time to time at his own fine black boots as they threaded a course through the archipelago of camel and horse turds. <laughs> the African employed an odd crab-wise scuttling style of circling, knees bent, eyes fixed on the Frank, the axe held loosely in his left fist. The awkward, almost fond way they went about readying themselves to murder each other moved the old Mahout, who had trained a thousand war elephants to kill, and so recognized the professional quality of the interest these two combatants were taking in the fight. But the other travelers, jostling under the eaves and archways of the inn yard, who knew nothing of the intimacy of slaughter, grew impatient. 
They jeered the combatants, urging them to hurry so they could all finish their suppers and file off to bed. Half maddened by boredom, they doubled their wagers. Word of the duel had reached the village down the hill, and the gate of the inn-yard was lively with women, children, and sad-faced lean men with heroic mustaches. Boys climbed to the roof of the inn, shook their fists, and hooted as the Frank and the African emptied their heads of last regrets. Then the axe, humming, seemed to drag the African toward the belly of the Frank. Its blade caught the torchlight and scrawled an arcing rune of fire in the gloom. The Frankish scarecrow dodged and watched and ducked when the axe came looking for his head. He dropped to his shoulder, rolled on the ground, surprisingly adroit for a scatter-limbed scarecrow, and popped up behind the African, kicking him in the buttocks with a look on his face of such childish solemnity that the spectators again burst into laughter. It was a contest of stamina against agility, and those who had their money on the former began with confidence in the favorite and his big Varangian axe, but the African, angered, grew gross and undiscerning in his axe play. He shattered a huge clay jar full of rainwater, soaking a dozen outraged travelers. He splintered the wheel spokes of a hay wagon, and as the solemn Frank danced, rolled, and thrust with his slender bodkin, the berserker axe bit flagstones, shedding handfuls of sparks. The torches guttered, and the tinge of blood drained from the moon as it rose into the night sky. A boy watching the fracas from the roof leaned too far out, tumbled, and broke his arm. Wine was fetched, mixed with clean water from the well, and handed in bowls to the duelists, who staggered and reeled around the inn-yard now, bleeding from a dozen cuts. Then, tossing aside the wine bowls, they faced each other. The watchful Mahout caught a flicker in the giant African's eyes that was not torchlight. Once more, the axe dragged the African, like a charger trailing a dead cavalryman by the heel. The Frank tottered backward, and then as the African heaved past, he drove the square toe of his left boot into the African's groin. All the men in the inn-yard squirmed in half-willing sympathy as the African collapsed in silence onto his stomach. The Frank slid his preposterous sword into the African's side and yanked it out again. After thrashing for a few instants, the African lay still as his dark, though not someone determined, black blood muddied the ground. The ostler signaled to a pair of grooms, and with difficulty they dragged the dead, the dead giant out to a disused stable beyond the present walls of the caravansary and threw an old camel skin over him. The Frank straightened his cuffs and hose and re-entered the caravansary, declining to accept the congratulations or good-natured japery of the losing betters. He declined to take a drink, too, and indeed, melancholy seemed to overcome him in the wake of the fight, or perhaps his natural inclinations toward northern gloom merely resumed their reign over his heart and face. He chewed his stew and took his leave. He wandered down to the stream behind the caravansary to wash his hands and face, then slipped into the derelict stable, doffing his ruined hat as if in tribute to the bravery of his opponent. How much, he said, as he entered the stable. Seventy, the giant African replied. <laughs> Stringing the laces of his felt bambakian, its counterfeit blood stains washed away in the horse trough to the horn of his saddle. He rode a red-spotted Parthian horse, tall and thick-muscled, whose name was Porphyrogene. Enough for a dozen fine new black hats when you get to rages. Don't even say the word hat, I beg you, the Frank said, gazing down at the hole in the high crown. It saddens me. Admit it was a fine throw, not half so fine as this hat, the Frank said. He laid the hat aside and opened his shirt, revealing a bright laceration that ran beaded with waxy drips of blood across his abdomen. Flows of blood swagged his hollow belly. He looked away 
and gritted his teeth as the African dabbed at him with a rag, then applied a thick black paste taken from a pot that the Frank carried in his saddlebags. I loved that hat almost as much as I love Hillel. At that moment, the animal in question, a woolly stallion with a Roman nose and its neck a rampant arch, stubby-legged and broad in the croup, the product of some unsupervised tryst between an Arabian and a wild tarpan, <laughs> gave a warning snort, and there was a scrape of leather sole against straw. The frank and the living African turned to the door, expecting the ostler, thought the old elephant trainer, with their share of the take, which included four of the Mahout's own hard-won Durhams. You mendacious sons of bitches, the Malhout said, admiringly, reaching for the hilt of his sword. Yeah, that's the end of that chapter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, just for fun, and we have some time, I'm going to actually, I'll, I'll take questions when I'm done here, too, and I know it's warm in here, but I thought I would just read the um, that very short afterward that I wrote for this novel at the request of the publisher. I mean, I wrote it at the request of the publisher. They don't know I'm here today. <laughs> the original working, and in my heart, the true title of this short novel was Jews with Swords. When I was writing it and happened to tell people the name of my work in progress, it made them want to laugh. I guess it seemed clear that I meant the title as a joke. It has been a very long time, after all, since Jews anywhere in the world routinely wore or wielded swords. So long that when paired with sword, the word Jews, unlike, say, Englishmen or Arabs, clangs with anachronism, with humorous incongruity, like Samurai Taylor or... <laughs> Santa Claus conquers the Martians. <laughs> True, Jewish soldiers fought in the Blade-era battles of Austerlitz and Gettysburg. Notoriously, Jewish boys were stolen from their families and conscripted into the czarist armies of 19th century Russia. Any of those fighting men, or any of the Jews who served in the armed forces, particularly in the cavalry units of their homelands prior to the end of World War I, might have qualified, I suppose, as Jews with swords. But hearing the title, nobody seemed to flash on the image of doomed Jewish troopers at Inkerman, Antietam, or the Somme, or of dueling Arabized Jewish courtiers at Muslim Granada, or even, say, on the memory of some ancient warrior Jew like Bar Kokhba or Judah Maccabee, famed for his prowess at arms. They saw, rather, an unprepossessing little guy with spectacles and a beard, brandishing a saber, the pirate Muddle Kenzoya. They pictured Woody Allen backing toward the nearest exit <laughs> behind a barrage of wisecracks and a wavering rapier. They saw their Uncle Manny, dirk between his teeth, slacks belted at the armpits, dropping from the chandelier to knock together the heads of a couple of nefarious auditors. <laughs> and okay, so maybe I didn't look very serious when I told people the title, yet I meant it sincerely or half sincerely, or maybe it would be more accurate to say that I could not have entitled this book any more honestly than by means of anachronism and incongruity. I know it still seems incongruous, first of all, for me or a writer of my literary training generation and pretensions to be writing stories featuring anybody with swords. As recently as 10 years ago, I had published two novels and perhaps as many as 20 short stories, and not one of them featured weaponry more antique than a lone Glock 9mm. None was set any earlier than about 1972, or in any locale more far-flung or exotic than a radio studio in Paris, France. Most of those stories appeared in sedate, respectable, and generally sword-free places like The New Yorker and Harper's, and featured unarmed Americans undergoing the eternal fates of contemporary short story characters. <laughs> Disappointment, misfortune, loss, hard enlightenment, moments of bleak grace. <laughs> Divorce, death, illness, violence, random and domestic. Divorce, <laughs> bad faith, 
deception and self-deception, love and hate between fathers and sons, men and women, friends and lovers, the transience of beauty and desire, divorce. <laughs> I guess that about covers it. Story, more or less, of my life. As for the two novels, they didn't stray in time or space any farther than the stories, or for that matter, any deeper into the realm of Jewishness. Both set in Pittsburgh, liberally furnished with Pontiacs and Fords, scented with marijuana, Shalimar, and kielbasa, featuring Smokey Robinson hits and Star Trek references, and starring Gentiles or assimilated Jews, many of whom were self-consciously inspired, instructed, and laid low by the teachings of rock and roll and Hollywood, but not, for example, by the lost writings of the Tzaddik of Regensburg, whose commentaries are so important to one of the heroes of Gentlemen of the Road. I'm not saying, let me be clear about this, I am not saying that I disparage or repudiate my earlier work or the genre late century naturalism it mostly exemplifies. I am proud of stories like House Hunting, S. Angel, Werewolves in Their Youth, and Son of the Wolfman. And out of all my novels, I may always be most fond of Wonder Boys, which saved my life, kind of or save me, at least from having to live in a world in which I must forever be held to account for the doomed second novel it supplanted. <laughs> I'm not turning my back on the stuff I wrote there late in the 20th century, and I hope that readers won't either. It's just that here, in Gentlemen of the Road, as in some of its recent predecessors, you catch me in the act of trying, as a writer, to do what many of the characters in my earlier stories, Art Beckstein, Grady Tripp, Ira Wiseman, were trying, longing, ready to do. I've gone off in search of a little adventure. If this impulse seems incongruous in a writer of this serious literary kind, <laughs> for which I had a long time hoped to be taken, it might be explained as I think the enduring popularity of all adventure fiction might be explained, with simple reference to the kind of person I am. I have never swung a battle axe or a sword. I have never, thank God, killed anybody. I've never served as a soldier of empire or fortune, infiltrated a palace or an enemy camp in the dead of night, or ridden an elephant. Though I have, barely, and without the least confidence or style, ridden a horse. I do not laugh in the face of death and danger. Far from it. I've never survived in the desert on a few swallows of acrid water and a handful of scorched millet. Never escaped from prison, the gallows, or the rowing benches of a swift caravel. Never gambled my life and fortune on a single roll of the dice. If I lose a hundred bucks at a Las Vegas craps table, it makes me feel like crying. <laughs> this is not to say that I've never had adventures. I've had my fill and more of them. Because adventures befall the unadventuresome as readily, if not as frequently, as the bold. Adventures are a logical and reliable result, and have been since at least the time of Odysseus, of the fatal act of leaving one's home, or trying to return to it again. All adventure happens in that damned and magical space, wherever it may be found or chanced upon, which least resembles one's home. As soon as you have crossed your doorstep or the county line into that place where the structures, laws, and conventions of your upbringing no longer apply, where the support and approval, but also the disapproval and repression of your family and neighbors are not to be had, then you have entered into adventure, a place of sorrow, marvels, and regret. Given a choice, I very much prefer to stay home where I may safely encounter adventure in the pages of a book, or seek it out, as I have here, at the keyboard, in the friendly wilderness of my computer screen. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if there is incongruity in the writer of a piece of typical New Yorker marital discord fare like That Was Me, a story in my second collection, turning out a swords and horses tale like this one, it's nothing compared to the incongru incongruous bounty to be harvested from the actual sight of me sitting on a horse, for example, or trying to keep from falling out of a whitewater raft, or setting off as I have done from time to time with sinking heart and uncertainty of failure, but goaded into wild hopefulness by some treacherous friend or bold stranger, in search of a Springsteenian something in the night. This 
incongruity of writer and work suggests, of course, that classic variant of the adventure story found in works as diverse as Don Quixote and Romancing the Stone, in which a devoted reader or author of the stuff is granted the opportunity or obliged to live out an adventure in real life. And it is seen in this light that the association of Jews with swords, of Jews with adventure, may seem paradoxically less incongruous. In the relation of the Jews to the land of their origin, in the ever-extending, ever-thinning cord, braided from the freedom of the wanderer and the bondage of exile that binds a Jew to his home, we can make out the unmistakable signature of adventure. The story of the Jews centers around, one might almost say that it stars, the hazards and accidents, the misfortunes and disasters, the feats of inspiration, the travail and despair, and intermittent moments of glory and grace that entail upon journeys from home and back again. For better and worse, it has been one long adventure, a 5,000-year odyssey from the moment of the true first commandment when God told Abraham, Lech Lecha, thou shalt leave home. Thou shalt get lost. <laughs> thou, shalt find, thou shalt find slander, oppression, opportunity, escape, and destruction. Thou shalt, by definition, find adventure. This long, long tradition of Jewish adventure may look a bit light on the Conans or D'Artagnans, our greatest heroes less obviously suited to exploits of daring do and arms. But maybe this ill-suitedness only makes Jews all the more ripe to feature in or to write this kind of tale. Or maybe it is time to take a look backward at that tradition, as I have attempted to do here, and find some shadowy kingdom where a self-respecting Jewish adventurer would not be caught dead without his sword or his battle axe. And if you still think there's something funny in the idea of Jews with swords, look at yourself right now, sitting in your seat, let's say, on a jet airplane, in your unearthly orange polyester and neoprene shoes, listening to digital music, crawling across the sky from Charlotte to Las Vegas, and hoping to lose yourself, your home, your certainties, the borders and barriers of your life by means of a bundle of wood pulp sewn and glued and stained with blobs of pigment and resin. People with books. <laughs> what in 2008 could be more incongruous than that. It makes me want to laugh. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. So there's a little time for questions. If anybody's got a question, I'm happy to answer. They don't have to be about uh, my writing or anybody's writing. It could be like dating advice or, yeah. Uh, when did you know that you wanted to be a writer? When did I know that I wanted to be a writer? Um, I was 11, and our teacher, in my teacher in junior high school, assigned us to write a short story. And I was really into Sherlock Holmes. Um, at the time, and I and I had just read this novel by Nicholas Merrick, The Seven Percent Solution, which was Nicholas Merrick's own version of a Sherlock Holmes novel, and everybody seemed to think that was a legit thing to do. Um, so I thought I would try the same thing, and so I wrote my own Sherlock Holmes story, and it was about um, Holmes meeting Captain Nemo from Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, and uh, I. I had such a great time doing it. I got so involved in it, and it was only supposed to be a couple pages long, and I ended up writing 12 pages. And, and I had to type the whole thing on this thing we had back then called a typewriter. Um, I just, I, I was so transported by the experience, and then I got an A. And my, and my parents said it was good, so I thought, okay, this this will work for me, because it's fun, and I got praised. So that's what I'm going to do. Oh yes. What are you reading now? What am I reading now? I am. Um, I'm very fortunate. I'm being. I've been permitted to have a look at the um, at a draft of Jonathan Lethem's next novel. Um, his follow up to 
um, what was it? You don't love me yet. Um, but his, what's really the follow-up to um, the Fortress of Solitude, and um, about halfway through it, it's pretty cool. Yes, sir. Whose books to movies? My books to movies, <laughs> or just in general? Um, uh, well, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. That's the one you're really asking about, right? <laughs> uh, it, it's, yeah, to, I mean, I mentioned Woody Allen in my afterward just there, and to quote Woody Allen, we have a dead shark. Um, it's not moving. Um, so, yeah, nothing's really happening with that. Uh, it, it got to a point, it was very close. We had a cast and director and script, which I wrote, and production designers and all those kinds of people. And, and people had taken their children out of school in Los Angeles and put them in school in England where the production was going to be, the interiors are going to be shot there. And I was already, you know, shopping for my Oscar tux. Um, <laughs> And then just literally at the last possible minute, the studio pulled the plug, and they just got cold feet. Um, so yeah, that's showbiz. Uh, Yiddish Policeman's Union is slated right now, as far as I know, to be the movie that the Coen brothers make after the one that they're making right now. I know, that's pretty exciting. So they, they, their new one just came out, which I haven't seen yet. Um, and then they're working on another one. It's something man. I can't remember what it's called. Serious, Serious man. Thank you. Thank you. Obviously, someone who goes to Ain't It Cool News <laughs> way too often. Um, and, uh, at, and that one's like getting rolling. And supposedly, Yiddish Policeman's Union is supposed to be after that. And I, so that would be awesome. I really hope it happens. But I've been, obviously, been, been down this road before. A lot can happen. Until you're actually sitting in the theater watching the movie. Yeah, you can't really count on it. Even then, they could probably find a way to break your heart. <laughs> they could like only release it in two states. And... <laughs> yes, sir. Um, yeah. Well, I didn't know him well. Um, I only met him once um, at a at a political event four years ago um, at, down in Los Angeles. It was a Kerry event, and a bunch of writers were there to read and raise money for the Kerry campaign, and um, I just met him backstage there. I was very intimidated by him, um, unfairly. I mean, he was, seems like have been a very sweet um, man. Um, he's, he was big, and, and he was so damn smart, and I just, I was very tongue-tied, and um, I felt like I needed to say something that he would, you know, find suitably impressive, and I just really did not come up with anything. So um, I was very disappointed in myself. And I, I even, I mean, that had, God knows I had no inkling, but I just had this feeling of like, well, there was your chance to talk to David Foster Wallace, and you blew it. Um, and, you know, now, sadly, I didn't realize just how true that was going to be. But um, he, I always thought of him as, his first novel was published in 1987. I was just finishing graduate school at UC Irvine, and I had a novel finished that was sub shortly thereafter was published. That was my first novel, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh. So I always felt of, thought of him as being very much a contemporary and a coeval of mine. Um, um, but I, I, but I, and I also always felt like our, our work was very different in a lot of ways. And his project and my project felt very different. But I loved his, um, especially his nonfiction work, the re his reporting, um, the piece he wrote about McCain, the cruise ship piece, um, the porn awards convention piece, the lobster piece. I mean, those are things I've read over and over and over again. And when I'm trying to write nonfiction myself, I, I read his, that stuff just to show me the right way to do it, how it's best done. Um, his novels meant somewhat less to me. Um, I had a hard time getting access, granting access to him. But for all that, I was very interested to read in some interviews that were quoted after, you know, when I was reading obituaries and, and t tributes to him after his death. Um, he had this theory about uh, literature, or the, the purpose of a literature, I suppose you could say, um, as a means of, of escape, in a sense, of breaking out of the prison of your own consciousness and and being granted access, I think is the word he used, to 
um, the mind of another person. And the only way that's really possible is through literature. And, um, you know, that I, I always talk about escape and being and, and, and making those connections. Even in what Melanie read tonight, there was a little sense of that. And the word entertainment itself um, comes from this root word that means two things growing together, entwining together, two trees that are in, entertained, are trees that are, are intertwined. And um, so and after I read that, uh, it made me realize maybe we were, we were actually all doing exactly the same thing. Any other questions? Yeah. So much of the work in your writing seems to take place outside of the issue of dialogue, or not outside of, but so much of the sort of linguistic play and everything like that is about having a dialogue specifically. And so I was wondering about the process of transforming your books to stream. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, well, when I was writing, when I was trying to adapt Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, um, it took me five and a half years to get to a final draft of the script, the one we thought we were going to film. And I really came to despise the author of the novel um, <laughs> in the course of that process, uh, because he did not give a moment's thought to the poor <laughs> schlep who was going to have to come along and try to adapt that stuff um, for the screen. I mean, I, I actually, I love writing dialogue and I work very hard on my dialogue in my novels and I, and I you know, I love to write a, a, a scene that has a lot of dialogue in it. Um, but even so, um, you're right. I mean, it's, it feels very crippling to me when I move into writing, to doing screenwriting and to realize all I have is dialogue and a little bit of action. You know, he goes over, opens the door. And it's his mother. That kind of very simple language, and you have to keep it short. And you're all, you're up against this this the perpetual curse of 120 pages. Um, it can't be any longer than that. It can't even really be that long anymore. And um, so therefore, you're just always taking out, taking out, taking out. And um, I I have a very a, a very powerful sense of constriction while I'm working, writing screenplays, partly because the space is so constrained, and partly because I am limited to dialogue, essentially. Did that experience of transforming the, the manuscript to, to the screenplay affect the way that you've written it in terms of um, Like, am I trying to make it easier on the Porsche <laughs> lep next time when he? Um, well, Yiddish Policeman's Union is uh, a little bit pared down, a little bit leaner compared to what preceded it. So maybe, but I was, that was more because I was um, trying to employ a kind of hard-boiled detective idiom there. So it seemed to, um, uh, it might be more of the fact that there's some kind of historical connection between screenwriting and hard-boiled detective fiction. And that somehow, and, and that, and Hemingway's influence sort of lying at the back of, of both of them. Um, that might be more of an explanation for the similarity there. But no, um, the big sense of, relief that I had was in writing this book after finishing the Yiddish Policeman's Union because I, in that novel I really did, in Yiddish, I really did try to keep my sentences a lot shorter. My natural period is very long and I'm always fighting against that a little bit, but in the Yiddish Policeman's Union I was just really severe with my sentences and my paragraphs and my chapters and everything. I tried to keep them much tighter and more focused and um, less complicated, and then the, I, I, literally within a week of finishing that book, I started writing this one, and I mean, you, it just came out like this, like, oh. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to see if I can get six dependent clauses into, <laughs> into this sentence, you know. Um, I had this, I mean, like when, pe when people have commented on this book and they said, you know, that the prose is maybe supposed to be a tribute to the purple writing of pulp fiction or, you know, classic adventure fiction. And, um, but for, it was much more of an accident than that. It just came out this way as a natural, as like a, you unkink a hose, you know, and just a flood of prose came pouring out. So two more questions. Okay. Two more questions, if there are two more questions. Yes? I was wondering, your um, recent work, Swedish Policeman, won the Hugo Award, which is, of course, for science fiction. And it seems like you're getting closer to sort of genre tropes within your literary fiction. Um, what do you think about the future of genre fiction and literary fiction as separate? Do you think they're going to diverge more in the future? Or do you think that they're sort of coming together into something that is really 
Um, well, I don't, I don't, I think they will always be separate to a degree, and I think they should be separate to a degree because there are things that you can say critically about science fiction that just don't come up when you're talking about um, Thomas Hardy or something like that, and vice versa. And, you know, they have their own um, tropes and their own conventions and, and all of that. But what, what I would like to see happen, what I hope is happening a little bit, is that people don't, that write, writers don't self-censor, that they don't restrain or restrict what they do because they fear you know, a, a critical derision um, that has typically traditionally um, been bestowed on writers of detective fiction and science fiction and so on, or fantasy fiction. So I, I imagine I can't be the only writer out there who thinks of him or herself as you know, a serious literary writer. Um, and yet loves science fiction, loves fantasy, wants to write science fiction and fantasy, but has a certain a anxiety, let's say, about doing that and sort of committing to that when you know that you might be setting yourself up for, for being banished to the um, ghettos of the bookstore. Um, and so I would like to see that go away, um, and I, because I think people should be able to write whatever they want to write. And then I also hope from the other side that um, that just that, that, that um, people who typically say to themselves, I don't like science fiction, I don't want to read science fiction, I don't, I don't like fantasy, I don't like detective fiction, might begin to encounter works like Cormac McCarthy's The Road, for example, or, um, or China Mieville's um, great um, works of sort of dark science fiction, fantasy, whatever you want to call them, or David Mitchell's novel, um, uh, well, Ghost Written or Cloud Atlas, um, works that are just, that really challenge your assumptions about what is and isn't genre, um, and that actually you do love science fiction if it's done well. You do love fantasy if it's done well. It doesn't, um, I mean, I think, I, oh, I hate the idea of, it's true with comics as well, that you, I hate to see a medium or a genre condemned um, on the basis of a few examples that are sort of cherry-picked for their crappiness. Um, you know, there's nothing about science fiction or, or mystery fiction that is inherently unliterary. That's just stupid to say so. One more question. Yes? I'm curious to know what you do with them. What I, what I, what? Wait, you're curious to know what I do with? What drew you to write the book? Oh, 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 about the, uh, the Khazars? Oh, I, th I thought you said, I'm curious to know what you do with hussars. <laughs> I don't know how that rumor got started, but I don't, I had nothing to do with those hussars. The dragoons is another matter. Um, uh, you know, I, I heard my, like my grandfather told me about the Khazar. I think this Arthur Kessler book came out in 1973 called um, The Thirteenth Tribe. Um, and it caused kind of a, it was a popular book at the time, and he advanced, he, he sort of gathered together every, all the little that was known about, about the Khazars, um, and he put it into fairly reasonable shape, and then he advanced this theory that after the, the Khazar empire collapsed, those people have migrated into um, Europe, Eastern and Northern Central Europe, and where they became the Ashkenazic Jews. And that, therefore, Jews were not Semites at all. They were descendants of this Turkic people. And, um, and this was Arthur Kessler's theory. And that has, you know, since, since DNA came along, it's been completely discredited and, and has no basis. In fact, although people do think maybe some Khazars did end up mixing into the population of Jews in Europe. Um, but, uh, you know, I just... Something about the idea of this lost kingdom of Jews, you know, just, God, you just put the words lost kingdom in front of almost anything and it sounds good. Um, <laughs> and especially that they're, that they're before Israel, um, there was at least, and, you know, and before modern Israel and after biblical Israel, um, there was this other Jewish land um, was, that no longer exists, was just really enchanting to me. And so I just, you know, Every thereafter, whenever I encountered any little tidbit about them, I always took an interest in it. And um, so 
I guess that's it. It's just sort of a lifelong footnote of history. I tend to get interested in footnotes in history, and that's what led me eventually to write the Yiddish Policemen's Union, too, because at some point I read about this crazy proposal to let Jewish refugees, I mean, not so crazy. It was, would have been great. I wish they had done it, but that to let Jews settle in Alaska um, in 1940, that was a real thing, and it really was really proposed um, uh, and, uh, you know, did not come to pass. So that was another sort of footnote. Footnotes to Jewish history. I bet there's a book that's even called that. And <laughs> I, my grandparents probably gave it to me uh, for Hanukkah one year. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for coming. I've really enjoyed being with you and talking to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michael. And again, thank you so much for all coming. Um, we do have some food and drink for you to enjoy. Also, please be sure to check out our book sale. We have not only Michael's books, but books from our upcoming season. And I'm sure the writers who are here tonight would be happy to sign those for you. And Michael will be signing books here at this table for um, a little while at least. And our next reading is October 9th, um, just across the hall in 190 Doe with Bahardi Mukherjee and Clark Blaze. So, who are right here, I, I hope to see you for that as well. And I just want to mention too, to make sure to check out our website where you can watch this reading or past readings that we've had as well. They're, they're usually put up in about a week. And I'm also recruiting for a few more student volunteers. So if you're interested in that, please come talk to me. Thanks again.